Oh, hello, hello, guys, and welcome back to Joe's Ventures. And today we're going to be playing Planet Zoo. We're going to be taking a look at a bunch of different mods. This will be part 29. We're almost coming to part 30. Part 30, I've got a big surprise for y'all. This is going to be awesome. So, yeah, we're going to have a look at a bunch of different mods people have been making. And we are going to be starting with the Pompous Dare by Frazzle64, who made all those ERLs that were really, really nice. So, we're going to be starting with the Pompous Dare. Let's get a good look at the mail here. Really wonderful animal, look at that. So the pampas deer is a species of deer that lives in the grasslands of South America at low elevations. And they inhabit these, a habitat includes waters and hills, often with drought, and then they grass high enough to cover a standing deer. And these guys mainly live on the Pantanal wetlands, but can survive other places, but mainly due to conservation efforts, they are kind of restricted to these mainlands, uh, these woodlands, wetlands because of a lot of the drying of wetlands for livestock and such. So they are considered near threatened, but luckily they're okay. So these guys are really interesting because they have this lighter fur that you can see going on here. And they reach a shorter height of about 60 to 65 centimeters. Uh, uh, six, yeah, 60 to 65 centimeters or 24 to 26 inches in males and 65 to 70 in males. So the males are slightly larger. And the tails are really short and bushy that you can see here. That was a really cute. And adult males of these uh, are pompous deer get between 24, 24 and 34 kilograms, but have been documented to get up to 40 kilograms. So that's a pretty big deer. And females will typically weigh between 22 and 29, which means they are a small species with not that huge sexual dimorphism. As you can see, they're not too differently sized from each other. And they have these really cool antlers that are three-pronged antlers that are much more simpler and they grow them yearly through a cycle. So they shed them in August or September with a new set growing in December. And that's how it kind of goes. In Argentina, the mating season is from December to February. In Uruguay, it's February to April. And the courtship behavior involves lots of like submissive things such as low stretch and crouching and turning away. And the male will in, uh, initiate courtship with like these long uh, stretches and buzzing sounds and things, which is really cool. Though it's really weird, they don't really maintain a territory like other deers, but they tend to have to show a display of dominance. And they show this by keeping their heads up and trying to keep their side forwards using slow and deliberate movements that they use to challenge each other. And when they feel like they may be in danger, they hide low in the foliage or hold and then bounce about 120 meters. Uh, bound 100 to 200 meters away, often looking back at the disturbance. So that's one of the things that they get weird with. And they have a diet of new shoot grows, shrubs and herbs, and most of the diet uh, plant life they consume is grows in moist soils, that's why they kind of live in wetlands and things. And to see if they compete with cattle food, they feces were studied and compared to, and they do not eat the, they do in fact eat the same plants, but they eat different proportions. So the pampas there, Eat less grubs and more forbs uh, than cattle. And during the rainy season, 20% of diet consists of these new grasses. And they'll move on the availability of the food, especially uh, flowering plants. And the presence of cattle increases the amount of sprouting grass, which is preferable for the pompous deer. Putting the idea that the deer do not compete with the cattle for food. And it's kind of like a disparity kind of people thing. Oh, my, the deer compete with food. For my cattle, so that's a bit sad. When fawns, fawns can be born at any time of the year. We'll have a look at the fawns. I'll have a look at the female, whatever female. Have a look at these cute little fawns. So fawns can be seen at any time of the year, but they peak around September and November. Females separate themselves into groups when they give birth, and they keep their fawn hidden away. After giving birth, the female goes into heat and usually mates within the next 48 hours. And the fawns are small and spotted and lose their spots about two months old. Usually one, only one fawn weighing about 2.2 kilos is born after a gestation period of about 7 months. In 6 weeks they can eat solid food and begin to follow their mother. They stay with their mother for at least a year and reach sexual maturity in about a year. So they are quite fast growers these guys. And luckily these guys are quite abundant. We'll have a look at a female while we're talking about it. Oh there's a male there. So the pampas in southern Argentina are, once were very abundant and are now considered a separate species. 
and they are con generally considered near threatened with some populations and subspecies being endangered. The overall decline has been due to hunting and poaching, also habitat loss due to agriculture, disease brought from domesticated and feral livestock, and competition from more recently induced wildlife such as other deer species and such, and general overexploitation. And less than 1% of the habitat was of the natural habitat left was, was present in the 1900s, so they've lost a lot of habitat. And they have no natural predators. They used to be prey for cougars and jaguars, but there's not many of them anymore in the areas. Though those in Brazil still have cougars to fear. And local people often blame disease for outbreaks uh, in livestock, such as uh, brucellosis and cattle. And they've even gone and said, we're going to kill these deer because they spread disease to uh, cattle, but it's sometimes often the other way around. And even sometimes there's not a much issue there, but luckily they are legally protected in places like Argentina, and there are federal reserves for them. So they are considered near threatened, so hopefully their conservation doesn't really become any severer. I really hope that doesn't. I want to move away from a pooping. But yeah, really, really cool animal. I really like pompous deer. So now we're going to move on to, we've got a very ungulate heavy episode. So we're going to move on from a deer to an antelope and then back into a deer. We have got the Black Buck by Bubbly Wums and Leaf, or Jen Bubbly Wums, which was, makes some of the greatest mods. This one's been waiting for a while, and we can have a look at these wonderful males here. Look at this wonderful guy. So, the Black Buck, also known as the Indian Antelope, are an antelope that live in India, I guess you could guess that, and Nepal. So they usually inhabit grassy plains and lightly forested areas with perennial water sources, so it's constant water sources, they like water. I mean, who doesn't? And they stand up to about 74 to 84 centimeters high at the shoulder, with males weighing between 20 and 57 kilograms, with an average of about 38 kilograms. Females are slightly lighter, weighing between 20 and 33 kilograms, or 27 kilograms on average. And you can see the males here, they have this really long bull horns that spiral about. They can get between 35 and 40 centimeters, uh, 35 to 75 centimeters, with these long ring horns, and females may develop horns as well, it just depends. You can see the white chew on their uh, white fur on the chin and around the eyes, a shock contrast to the hair that helps break their outline as well. And the coats of the males show this two-tone coloration that you can see here with the light uh, darker and lighter. You see the females are much more brightly colored, you can see in comparison, which I think is quite cool. And females and juveniles, you can see, are usually the tawny color, we'll have a look at that later. And the sole living ge uh, member of the genus Antelope and was described by Carl Linnaeus, who was based at the Inventor Taxonomy in 1758. So it's pretty cool. So you can see these guys mainly live in three types of groups. You can have these female male uh, herds and male and bachelor herds. So they also adopt a lurking system, a strategy with uh, Tagana females. So what they do is they'll have uh, like a territory or area what they perform and try and attract females. And while other males are not allowed to these territories, females often visit in forage, and they're a herbivore and grazes on low grass and occasionally browsing. Females are sexually mature at the age of eight months, but mate no earlier than two years of age. Males mature later at one and a half years. Mating takes place throughout the year. We'll have a look at the female while we're talking about her. And uh, gestation lasts typically six months uh, after a single calf is born with a lifespan of about Seven, uh, 10 to 15 years. So we can see the female has got a much tawnier color and we can find a baby. There's a baby. There should be a baby here. There's a baby. There's a baby. Yep. Oh no, there's a drop. There should be some babies in here. This one's a baby. And you can see they got this really light color as a baby. Really, really cool though. Wonderful animal. So these antelopes are uh, mainly found around uh, India and is locally extinct in Pakistan, uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh, sadly. Should be some reintroductions there. They used to be formerly widespread, uh, but only scattered herds can be seen today, largely confined to protective areas. During the 20th century, their numbers declined sharply due to excessive hunting, deforestation, and habitat degradation. The black buck has also been introduced to Argentina and the United States and are often kept on game ranches and stuff to be hunted. And in India, they're prohibited uh, hunting under the Wildlife Act, and they actually have a significant uh, impact in Hinduism, and Indian and Nepali villages do not harm these antelopes. So 
luckily they're not hunted by a lot of these villagers but and they are considered least concerned because there's still a lot of them left but obviously with a lot of animals even if they are common they are restricted to areas where there's not a lot of people with pristine wild habitats such as national parks and conservation areas which sucks but still a wonderful animal jenny did a wonderful job and leaf thank you for porting it and we can have a look at this really cute baby such adorable much well so now we're going to be moving on to the next animal this one was also done by bubbly ones and leaf we have got another deer we've got the white tail deer we can have a look at this lovely male here that looks really really nice so the white tail deer or also called the uh, just the white tail or the virginia deer they are a medium-sized deer native to North America, Central America, Ecuador, and South America as far as Peru and Bolivia. But they have also been introduced to places like New Zealand, all the greater Antilles in the Caribbean, and some countries in Europe. Also, these places like the Czech Republic, Finland, Romania, Serbia, Germany, and France, where they've been introduced, obviously, for hunting. And in the Americas, they're the mostly, uh, most widely distributed ungulate. So in North America, these guys are widely distributed east of the Rocky Mountains, as well as southern Arizona, southwestern Arizona, and north of Mexico, except the lower California, where they're mostly displaced by the mule deer, which actually might clade within uh, white-tailed deer. It's a very complex taxonomy, which is pretty cool. But they can be found pretty much everywhere, except mainly the western coast of the United States. So, pretty, pretty common. So... These guys vary a lot in weight, um, just because they have such a huge range. The average size is larger due to uh, Bergman's rule and Allen's rule, which means that animals that live in cooler, higher latitudes are generally bigger. So the more they get to north or really south, away from the equator, the bigger they are going to get. So that would be most likely north. They can get between 68 for males, 68 kilograms to 136 kilograms. But mature bucks over 180 kilos have been recorded in the most, most northernmost parts of their range. And um, some of these bigger record ones was estimated to be like 232 kilos, so pretty big boy. A female doe in North America usually weighs between 40 and 90 kilograms. We'll have a look at a doe while we're talking about her. She a cutie doe. <laughs> Puns. So they usually weigh between 40 and 90 kilos. And the ones found in the... Florida Keys are markedly smaller. They get average between 35 and 50 kilograms, with an occasional female getting as small as 25 kilograms. That's part of Bergwin's rule, because they pretty much live smack dab on the equator. They tend to be a lot smaller. And you can see they have these really, really interesting colors. They have like this reddish brown in the spring and summer that turns to gray through fall, along with a little bit of counter shading that you can kind of see, not really on this one, but you can see there's usually a little bit of counter shading under here. Really, really nice model. And you can see the males, like other deer, they regrow their antlers every year. And 1 in 10,000 females will also have antlers, which is pretty cool. And you can see that this one has a pretty nice set of antlers. Really wonderful animal. They usually grow in late spring, covered with a highly vascularized tissue that's called velvet. Often it's actually harvested. And um, that's what they use. It gives all the nutrients to the growing horn, uh, growing antlers, I mean. And that means uh, when the velvet comes off, you can see they also get these really nice horns. Really, really nice. So these guys are also very, very adaptable since they live all pretty much everywhere in the U uh, US and even in South America. They live in a wide variety of habitats. Even though they're mostly forest animals, they can be spot in open prairies, woodlands, and sage communities. Pretty much wherever you find plants, you find deer, <laughs> which is pretty cool. I need a large amount of food. They'll feed legumes, uh, grasses, cacti, shoots, pretty much whatever they can. And they can actually eat things like mushrooms and poison ivy, which humans can't eat. That's pretty cool. And they're also in the wild. They're protected by a bunch of species such as wolves, cougars, American alligators, jaguars in the southwest Mexico where they live. And probably when jaguars used to range a lot more north into the US. Uh, they can kill adults and even humans, of course. And including uh, healthy adults, uh, bobcats, Canada lynx, grizzly, and American black bears, wolverines, and coyotes can prey mainly on fawns, and often scavenged by new world raptors, uh, new world vultures, raptors, grey foxes, and corvids. So they're pretty important in the ecosystem. They provide a lot of food. 
And in fact, a lot of areas where they live, a lot of these predators like wolves and bears are a lot more, a lot less common than they used to be. So their populations are a little bit harder to control. And that's why there has been overpopulations of deer in areas with no wolves and large predators, which kind of sucks. But you can see that this baby's very, very cute. <laughs> i got to add that in. So females come into estrus around the rut, normally late October to November. And that can depend on population density. Females give birth to one or three spotted young, known as fawns, in mid to late spring, generally in May and June. And male fawns tend to be slightly larger with females, but they weigh between 44 and 77 pounds, or 20 to 35 kilos. For the first four weeks, uh, their fawns are hidden in vegetation by their mothers, and nurse them about four to five times a day. And they keep, keep the scents low due to avoid predators, and about eight to ten weeks they're usually uh, weaned off, and they're hanging around with their mother and then they lose their spots about several months and then they start to leave their mothers about a year or two so you can see they're really really cool so as i mentioned these guys are often overpopulated, overpopulated in some areas due to uh not enough big predators to control their numbers so that means humans have to do it and um, that means that can uh, increase the chances of car crashes and things like that and even damages to farming such as orchards and such and luckily there is very uh, common hunting and even farming also spread diseases from animals that are domestic animals to them and then back, back and forth which is always very bad uh, the, mentioned very important for the food web and yeah, it's just a really, really cool uh, animal. Nothing wrong with a good deer. So I really like this one. I think it came out really well. So now we're moving on to another deer. This one wasn't made by Bubbly Wums or anyone. This one was made by Narawaller, and we have got probably the most famous deer of them all, or at least one of them, but the red deer. And I just want to show you this really nice stack I got. Really wonderful animal. So. The red deer is one of the largest species of deer, and this wonderful stag here uh, is they call stags, and the females are hinds. We can see we got an albino hind, uh, albino hind in the back. Really, really cool. So these guys mainly live in most of Europe, such as the Caucasus, uh, Asia, Iran, western parts of Asia, and Central America. I mean, Central, not Central America, Central Asia, Asia. And have been introduced to places such as Australia, New Zealand, Peru, uh, Uruguay, Chile, Argentina, and the United States. And these guys are ruminants, which are characterized by their four-chambered stomachs. And they're actually not a single species, really. Their taxonomy is really weird, because they have been split into a couple species just because of how they genetically relate to things like um, elk or waipati. So it's a pretty interesting conservation there. So there's probably two or three species. So there's kind of one that lives in Europe and one that lives in Asia and another that lives more in Siberia, which is pretty cool. And these guys can get pretty big. They're like the second biggest uh, deer. Oh, well, not the second biggest, third biggest after like elk and moose. So a male stag can generally get between 175 to 200 centimeters long and weigh between 160 and 240 kilograms. A female hind is generally 160 to 210 centimeters and can weigh between 120 and 170 kilograms. And in Scotland, the stag averages about 201 centimeters in body length, and females about 180. And they just and it can really change a lot with what habitats they're living in. It really, just depends. And you can see they can get these very huge antlers as well. So antlers typically measure about 71 centimeters in total length and about a kilo in weight. Although large ones can get to 115 centimeters and weigh up to five kilos in weight. And they grow at about a rate of 25, uh, 2.5 centimeters a day. So that's very, very interesting. And they usually, the growth of these antlers is driven by testosterone, which means it's time to breed, time to breed, let's go. And we can see that there's a really nice uh, red coat that gives them the name of the red deer. It's really cool animals. So let me just... So these guys usually live and stay in single sex groups throughout the year and when rut comes, uh, stags will come and call the attention of their hinds and they will collect a small herd of them and defend them from other stags, which is really cool. They can get up to as many 20 hides that they keep from each other, which is really cool. And we'll have a look at the female. Have a look at our bino female that we've got. Where is she? There she is. 
That was really cool that I got an albino. So, these guys will hang out with a male in the breeding season. And that defends them from other males. While he mates with the females. And they generally reach sexual maturity at about uh, two years of age. And their gestation usually lasts between 240 to 262 days. And the offspring, when they're born, can be way up to 15 kilograms. And often, they give birth in autumn and can even have one to two babies. Most commonly one. But that's pretty cool. And after two weeks, the calves join the herd and are, are fully weaned after two months. The offspring will remain with its mother for almost one full year, leaving about the next season offspring is about to be produced. The gestation period is pretty much the same for all the species slash subspecies. And all the red uh, deer calves born are spotted, as you can see here. Let's have a look. You can see they're spotted. That's quite common in deer. And they lose their spots about the end of summer. And as in many species of old world deer, some adults do retain a few of these spots in their summer coat, which is pretty interesting. And they can live up to 20 years of captivity. In the wild, they can live up to 10 to 13 years. Though some areas uh, have been seen to live up to 15 years with less predation pressure. So these guys uh, retain their antlers for more than half the year and are less gregarious and less likely to group with other males uh, than when they have antlers. And they are pretty usually pretty safe because they live in herds and are pretty large. They're pretty much the only animals that really give them a run for their money are wolves and bears that could hunt an adult. But usually also boars and Eurasian lynx will hunt the calves. Leopards will also hunt them and perhaps in history the atlas bear and the barbary lion and the barbary leopard, leopard hunted these stags. Which sadly pretty much all of them are, ex uh, the population is extinct. And maybe even the Caspian tiger which is a population of Siberian tigers that has gone extinct, sadly. So yeah, and they are farmed in places like New Zealand and such, and they farm for their velvet as well as their meat, and a really, really cool animal. And I love this stag, this is a really nice stag. Now, Wally, you did a very good job. Now, Walla, you did a, a great job indeed. So now we're going to be moving on. We're not going to be doing any more deers. We're all done, the deers. So now we're going to be moving on to a subspecies. We have got here the Eurasian Wolf. That looks really nice, not gonna lie. So the Eurasian Wolf, or Canis lupus lupus, is also known as the Common Wolf or the Middle Russian Wolf, Forest Wolf. It's probably the largest and most popular of the Old World Wolf subspecies. So these guys are pretty much found all over uh, Europe and uh, the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union, or so basically Russia. And were once widespread throughout Eurasia throughout the Middle Ages. And aside from an extensive uh, paleological record, there's several types of wolves that these guys, there's like such as Italian wolves and Iberian wolves, but these guys are just the ones that you can find most commonly in Eurasia. So they're the largest of the old world grey wolves. They average about 39 kilos in Europe. However, some exceedingly large individuals can get between 69 and 79 kilograms, although this varies depending on the regions and such. So, you can also see they've got this nice tawny color and you can also get melanistic albinos individuals. And you can actually see that they are rare, but they actually do result a lot from wolf dog hybridization. And the howl of these guys is actually much more pronounced and melodious uh, than the North American gray wolves, which howls a louder and strong emphasis of the first syllable. And these most uh, rare Asian wolf populations subsist largely on livestock and garbage with dense human areas, uh, dense human activities, which is kind of sad. They kind of just survive on what they can and obviously pursued because uh, they kill livestock. No one likes it when their livestock's killed by wolves. But in areas that are much less disturbed, they hunt moose, red deer, roe deer, wild boar, and other things such as wisents, agal, moose, uh, saiga, wild goats, musk deer. Pretty much anything that's big enough for them to feed on, they will. So, these guys sadly were very much in decline because, and especially in Europe, because Europe has had a big issue with hunting, and they pretty much almost went extinct in Europe. But luckily, they have been recovering. There have been populations both introduced and uh, reintroduced, and populations coming in from uh, Russia back and moving back into Europe. But um, that's really cool. So that's why they've been recovering since the 50s and people have been really putting their, helping them with that. So that's been really awesome. And there are most areas they are legally protected. So that's cool. And they do affect uh, grazing animals, but 
there are ways to avoid it, such as having sheepdogs and good fences and such. So yeah, luckily these guys are going to be on the recovery, and it seems to be, especially with the um, Europe, rewilding Europe uh, stuff that's been happening, that's been really going hard. We're getting lots of white and stuff, so luckily their populations are recovering. So it's a really nice conservation story. They've been doing much better now. I'm a, I'm a sucker for a good conservation story. So the Eurasian Wolf was done by Havoc1199, uh, Gaboy, and Mega Rex Gaming. Just thought I'd point that out before we move on to the next one. We're going to be having a look at Tiger Shark. Where is it? There you are, Tiger Shark. Oh, you disappeared for a minute. So this one was done by Leaf, Genora Pizza, and Arkia. I believe this was ported from Endless Ocean 2, which is the next one as well. So the Tiger Shark is a subspecies of the... Uh, not a subspecies, a regular species of Requiem Shark. And they are a very large migratory predator shark that can get up over five meters long. So most populations of these guys tend to live in tropical and temperate areas across the world, especially around the Central Pacific Islands. And they get the name tiger shark, as you can see, they've got these kind of stripes down their body here that are very indicative of a uh, tiger. So that's where they get the name tiger sharks. They're normally pretty solitary, also nocturnal hunters and they are notoriously having the widest food spectrum of any shark they usually eat pretty much anything from crustaceans fish seals birds dolphins turtles sea snakes and even other smaller sharks so it's pretty interesting they even have the reputation of a garbage eater where they'll eat all sorts of things like such as inedible man-made objects have been found in their stomachs and though ex apex predators, they are sometimes taken as prey for other groups of killer whales and are considered sadly near threatened because they are hunted by people for shark fin soup and other things, which sucks. So these guys get pretty big, they get between 3.25 and 4.25 uh, meters long and generally weigh between 385 to 635 kilograms. The exceptionally large females can get up to 5 meters and the largest males get up to 4 meters, so females are slightly larger. And in fact, there was one pregnant female court of Australia that reportedly measured 5.5 meters long and weighed between and weighed up to 1,524 kilograms. Even though that's unconfirmed, there's some papers that mentioned seven meter longs one, but they are far larger than any uh, specimen we know of. So we really kind of have no idea. So they're among the largest extant sharks. The tiger sharks uh, ranks an average size only behind the whale shark, the basking shark, and the great white shark, and is the second largest predatory shark after the great white, which we'll talk about soon. So these guys are pretty much found around the Gulf of Mexico, they can be found as far north as Japan and far south of New Zealand, very very wide range of species, and tiger sharks they can dive, dive pretty deep, they dive about 900 meters, but some sources they usually move around shallow water and usually hang out in seen in depths around 6 to 12 meters they're not exactly deep diving sharks and as i mentioned they eat pretty much anything includes sea snakes marine mammals uh, dugongs green sea turtles pretty much everything and when they reach sexual maturity about 2.9 meters long and females are 3.5 meters long that's when they usually reach sexual maturity and the young let's see if we can find a pup we go, there, i know i have a pup in here there he is really cute pup so the young develop in their mother's body for about 16 months lizards can range from 10 to 80 pups the newborn is generally born at 51 to 76 centimeters long and how long they live for is unknown but can be up to 12 years and it's really interesting to see how these guys uh, ontogeny has been studied apparently uh, juvenile tiger sharks are more conical and similar to other requiem sharks and kind of get broader and broader as they grow up so that's pretty cool so sadly these guys are captured and killed for fin, flesh and liver and they are several populations that are declining because they've been heavily fished and luckily they are protected some places they are considered near threatened and in somewhere like New Zealand they're considered migrant at the cot and they are severe overseas so that means they need should be protected where they aren't really hunted and these guys are responsible for the most uh, second most I think or the first most, way they're all. A lot of human attacks. Even though sharks really bite humans, the tiger shark is responsible for most of them. And uh, between 1959 and 2000, 4,668 tiger sharks were culled in efforts to protect the tourism industry. But obviously that never goes well. 
And sharks are very important for ecosystems, even though they may hurt people occasionally by accident. There's not really any evidence that they hunt uh, people. But they're very important in regulating ecosystems, and a lot of sharks take a long time to throw up. So that's why we should protect them, and plus tiger sharks are just great. How can you not love a tiger shark? So now we're going to be moving on to another shark. We're going to be moving on to probably the most famous shark. And this one was also done by Leaf, Genora Pizza, and Arcadia. This is another port from Endless Ocean 2. They've got the Great White Shark. So I've already covered this one a little while ago, but I'll just give a brief rundown. You can go watch that episode, but I just want to give a quick rundown. So the Great White Shark, also known as the White Pointer, the White Shark, or the Great White, is a species of mackerel shark that be found in coastal waters around the world. They are the largest kind of predatory sharks, they can lead to the basking of whale sharks in size. The females can get uh, up 6 to 1 meters long, so 6.1 so is about 20 feet, and up to about 200, 2200 kilograms, so it's huge. And males generally get up to 4 meters. Uh, uh, on average, with females getting 4.9 on average, that these large individuals can get huge, huge. And they could live up to about 70 years or more, which is really, really interesting. So they are actually one of the longest-lived cartilaginous fish as well at that age, and they take 26 years to mature in males, and females take 33 years to mature, and can swim at speeds of up to 25 kilometers an hour in short berths and, dip, and dive to depths of about 1,200 meters. So these guys have no no natural predators other than very rare occasions the killer whale is arguably the world's largest extent macro predatory fish and is one of the primarily predators of a lot of marine mammals such as seals and such. In fact babies will tend to eat fish and as they grow up to adults then they'll start eating marine mammals and such such as seals and they'll even eat uh, scavenge on whale carcasses as well. And the only known last surviving member of the genus Cocaridon and have perhaps the more uh, the most recorded human bite incidents than uh, the sharks since they're used to hunting marine mammals but usually those are on accident because they think oh you're a seal but in fact they are you are actually just something that's bony and they don't want to eat you but unfortunately a test bite from these guys can take off your legs so no harm they fell <laughs> ish so they are considered vulnerable and a lot of this thing, such as persecution from people, such as movies like Jaws, putting uh, sharks in more of a negative light, that sucks. But also, very slow breeders, as I mentioned. Females taking up to 33 years to mature. It means they breed really slowly. And they have, and this depiction as a ferocious man-eater did not help, since people often try to uh, avoid sharks and... We should always try to avoid sharks and people hunting sharks because all oh, they think they're going to kill people, but they really don't. And great white sharks are very important predators in the ecosystem. They regulate numbers of other animals. Very important. But yeah, if you want to learn a little bit more, I got some on that, guys. But these guys are just wonderful. Great white sharks are some of the coolest animals, and this is a really nice model. I think Endless Ocean is going to be. It's really cool to see people porting models. I think from other games into this one, and they can actually usually come out pretty well. See, so yeah, that's pretty exciting. So now we're going to move on from the Great White. We've got a couple dinosaurs now. I know people love their dinosaurs. So we're going to be starting off with a really, really cool dinosaur. We have got Coelophysis. We'll have a look at the adult here. This is the adult male. So Coelophysis is an extinct genus of Coelophysid theropod dinosaur. So these guys are from the early uh, the Jurassic. They live approximately between 221 to 296. Uh, million years ago in the tr later part of the Jurassic period in South Africa, Zimbabwe, and the southwestern United States. So these guys are quite simply built as you can see here. They are one of the earliest dinosaurs and they could grow up to about three meters long in one of the earliest known dinosaur genera. And they were discovered I think in 1887, so pretty old. So they're known from a lot of complete fossils. There's been such bone beds that preserve a whole group of them and such. So these guys are lightly built, about 3 meters long, and can get up to about 20 kilograms in the robust form, 15 kilos in their fossil form. And they're considered a bipedal carnivorous theropod dinosaur and considered a very fast, agile predator. And you can see they've got these narrow hips and long legs, which was kind of like an evolving form for these guys. It was really when dinosaurs were just starting to become popular um, 
in the ecosystem. So that's where you can see the kind of earliest dinosaurs looked like, which is really cool. And um, these guys, obviously, predatory dinosaurs, they fed on whatever they can. Uh, there's even evidence that these guys were cannibals. As they found babies in their uh, uh, stomachs. But they actually found that these guys, what was considered that they were considered cannibals, but actually was a small cursorial reptile such as Chesposaurus. But it's very, very likely that these guys could have been cannibals. It's not very unlikely. And there has been evidence of pack behavior of these guys with a lot of these guys, such as Ghost Ranch. There's like 40 of them. It's been preserved. But it's he neither here nor there because it could have been just been an aggregation of them over a water hold or whatever and been buried in a catastrophic, catastrophic flood. There's also evidence potentially of sexual dimorphism, which is obviously another hard thing to figure out because of not knowing, figuring out how to tell sexes apart just by bones can be difficult. And these guys lived in the Chinle Formation about New Mexico. And this is like goat ranch. And some other species have been seen in the Upper Elliot. So these guys lived in species uh, with species such as Smartosuchus, Hesperosaurus, uh, Rasukians such as Ephigia, uh, different ammonites and things. Very interesting ecosystem there. And the Upper Elliot had animals like Massospondylus, uh, Vaprosaurus, Heterodontosaurus, Lithosaurus, a bunch of different animals. It's kind of understudied, but still really, really cool. And we can see here, this person who made this, TNT made this, uh, I forgot to mention that. You can see he added a speculative uh, wattle here, which is probably not the best looking, but I think it's cool that he added something speculative. Uh, and I think it's really cool how he made this. This is pr pretty much a rig edited animal. It's rated from the peacock, I think. So this is like a really extreme rig editing. That's so cool. And we can see that's a male here. We have a look at the female. The female does not have this um, wattle that you can see here. And the little babies, they have feathers, which is so cute. Though we do not know if Coelophysis really had feathers. It's very likely that they did. And the f when feathers originated in dinosaurs is a very complicated topic. It gets really interesting to talk about because there is the possibility that the pycnofibers that we see in pterosaurs and the feathers that we see in dinosaurs may uh, be the kind of the same thing and may be basal to dinosaurs. And then a lot of dinosaurs like the ceratopsians, uh, a lot of ornithopods may have actually independently lost, uh, even sauropods as well, may have lost their feathers independently. It's just we don't really have the fossils to say, and it's really interesting to talk about. It's a really interesting debate, but I think they did a really good job with that one. So TNT did a good job. And for last but not least, we've got another model by TNT. We have got the big bad. This is a remaster. We have got the Triceratops. Look at this wonderful big guy. Here's an amazing, incredible look at that wonderful animal. So Triceratops is a genus of herbivorous ceratopsian dinosaur that appeared in the late Maastrichtian, so that's the last part of the Cretaceous period in the late Cretaceous, of about 68 million years ago in North America. And is one of the, considered one of the last known non avian dinosaur genera and went extinct at the KPT boundary with animals such as Tyrannosaurus uh, and animals like that. Very famous, very cool as well. So these guys have these very charismatic bodies. They have this large frill and these three horns. In fact, Triceratops means a three-horned face. And they're kind of vaguely uh, similar to a rhinoceros, but they are huge and are one of the largest of uh, Ceratops. If the largest Ceratops yet considered one of the bigger dinosaurs, they could get up to about nine meters long and weigh about 12 tons. Though that is kind of obviously weight estimates for extinct animals can be iffy, but that's generally considered their size. And shared its habitat with the uh, probably the only much more famous dinosaur, Tyrannosaurus rex, which would have been prey, uh, this guy would have been prey of. So that's part of the reason why it may have evolved these big horns. Same with Ankylosaurus with its armor. And it may have been an evolutionary arms race with Tyrannosaurus getting these big powerful jaws and these guys evolving frills and horns and uh, armor to protect themselves. So that's really cool. So there are two species known of... Triceratops, there's the earliest one. This one is Triceratops horridus. And you can tell the difference is mainly by their skull and nose horn. Triceratops horridus had a much smaller nose horn and a much bulkier face. 
while Triceratops Horridus, um, Prorosus, I mean, generally had a much bigger nose horn and a much more slender face. And this is a case of anagenesis, so Triceratops Horridus evolved into Prorosus. And there has been talk about an animal called Taurosaurus that is actually believed to be an adult Triceratops. Though that is very, very debated and it's most likely not because Triceratops on average got larger than uh, Taurosaurus and they're just so different. That's why they're different genera, genus. And these guys were discovered in 1889. They actually originally thought to belong to bison but it's actually one of the oldest and most famous dinosaurs and is just one of the important dinosaurs in history so we can see this lovely male here this one's based on the model of the isle it's kind of a remaster so we can see the male here this is a wonderful female then you see how it come out so you can see this is definitely a pororosus but i'm a i mean you can see the much smaller nose horn and the much more bulky face and let's have a look at the little babies. Aren't they adorable? I'd love to see... We have a really good growth series of um, Triceratops. So we pretty much know how they grew. And you can see the babies here. They had this very, very uh, squished in face. Uh, and then as they grew up, their kind of horns kind of went from standing up. And then they folded back to look like the adult ones here. So they would have kind of like that. And then kind of like shaped out to that. So that's... A really interesting thing to learn about the ontogeny, that's how many good specimens we have. Triceratops is probably one of the best studied dinosaurs. We also know that they, we also know that they're, they're um, scales too. We can see that they have this, like, nipple scales, that's what they're called. Little scales that come up like that. So I think that really shows how much we know about dinosaurs. Even though they've been dead for millions and millions of years, we can learn a lot about dinosaurs. And we know a lot about Triceratops. So that's really, really cool and a really awesome dinosaur so yeah i think this would be a great place to end the episode i really hope you guys enjoyed this and i really guys like the triceratops i think this is a great improvement over the old one and it's nice to see that we know so much about dinosaurs even though they've been dead forever um i'm just in fascination of it so yeah that's a good place to end so let me just pull out so i really 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 hope you guys enjoyed this video i hope you guys like and subscribe Always remember to get that little bell icon to get notified about anything. So yeah, hopefully you guys enjoy this video. If you guys like and subscribe, and bye bye.